So there's a story of a man who was having his mother and father-in-law over for Thanksgiving dinner. The day finally arrived, and sure enough, the in-laws arrived at his home. They're invited into the living room, and the rest of the family's in there having a chat before the Thanksgiving meal. The man's daughter, only four years old, runs up to her grandma and gives her a big hug, and she says, I am sure happy to see you, grandma. I've missed you. Well, thank you, sweetie, the grandmother says. I'm so happy to see you as well. The little girl spoke up again and said, Now that you're here, maybe daddy will do that trick he was talking about. The father looks at the daughter, very puzzled right now, and says, Honey, what are you talking about? What trick was I going to do? And the little girl said, I heard you tell mommy this morning that if her parents came today, you were going to climb up the walls. Amen. (laughs) Well, there you go. There's your joke of the day. Just for a record, it's always a blessing when my in-laws come into town. There's no wall climbing that happens when my in-laws come to town. More so because I'd probably hurt myself. But anyway, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. I hope it's a great week with family and friends. At the end of service today, I'm going to be given dismissal instructions for the meal. Uh, It's very strategic, so I I need to make sure that you're in here for that. Also, we're going to give dismissal instructions, let you know where the food pantry is going to be. We've got 200 bags of groceries to give away if you're in need there. Also, we have a huge coat room, room set up, and so I'm going to be given instructions for that as well. Uh, just want to get a huge, a huge thank you to our uh, Thanksgiving coordinator, Jen Harkins, and all the volunteers. Can we hear it up? All the volunteers. These guys have been here all week uh, preparing for this, and so uh, I know they're probably busy right now, but just our appreciation uh, goes out to them. Isn't God good? What God has done, it just, it just amazes me. Okay, I'm not going to preach a long time today. Don't say amen to that. Um, And I'm only going to read one verse as we get started here this morning. We're going to come back and we're going to put it into context. If you're using the YouVersion Bible app on your phone, all the notes and things like that are going to be in there as well. So we're going to read 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 26. I believe God has given me a great truth here today that's not going to only encourage you, but potentially can change your life. Uh, This, this I believe, is is a great truth. Um, somebody in here needs to hear what I'm about to say this morning, so I need you to listen up, and I need you to listen up very carefully. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26, here is what it says. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at will. I'm calling this message this morning, The Rebounder. Father, for the next few moments, I ask that you would give me the mind of Christ I ask God that you would help me to present this great truth in a way that's easy to understand, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that as this is spoken, God, if you don't anoint these words, this message will fall flat. It will be pointless. But God, if you anoint these words, it has the potential to change lives. And people will leave this place different than when they walked in. And so, God, we thank you in advance for what you're about to do in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. I tell you what, is there anybody that's good at shooting free throws? I've got two $25 gift cards up here. I'm going to have two people come up. I got, a ch- I got a Red Robin and a Chipotle. If you can, all right, we got one right up. Come on, come on down. And okay, we'll do a lady right here. Come on down. All right, here we go. Here's my free throw. Now, if you, if you miss and you break something, I get to keep your gift card. Okay, we're going to let you go first. Which one are you going for, Chipotle or Red Robin? Red Robin, all right, okay. So we're just going to kind of spitball this right here. This is probably about right. So there you go. All right, so all you have to do is make a free throw, and you're going to Red Robin. Here we go. Oh, man. Well, here we go. Just hold on. I'm going to give you the rebound. Let's try it again. Here we go. All right. This is the rebounder after all. Oh, man. Hey, the, the, the hoop's moving. All right. Okay, here we go. We're going to try it again. All right. Oh, oh, here we go. We're going to pop it in, and it's good. There you go. (laughs) All right. Hey, now, if she makes one, you're in trouble, all right? (laughs) Come on up. What's your name? Romeo. Romeo? Right on, right over here. Did you play basketball in high school? No. All right. Okay, here we go. 
Give it a shot. This is for Chipotle. Oh, that was close. There we go. We're going to try it again. And oh, we're going to try it one more time. You're so close. Oh, 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 there she goes. Congratulations. Yes. We'll just leave that there. All right, anybody want to come up and play one-on-one -on -one now? Just kidding. We're not going to do that. You guys really make me look bad. Playing basketball in church. You know, in, in basketball, everybody knows that scoring is important. If you don't have anybody that can actually put the points on the board, you, you can't win the game. But even more important than someone having someone that's great at shooting the baskets, the thing that separates the good basketball teams from the great ones is having a great rebounder. Because no matter how good you are at getting the ball in the hoop, there's always going to be missed shots. NBA great Michael Jordan said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. On 26 occasions, I have been entrusted to take the game-winning shot, and I missed. The rebounder is the person that gets the ball after the shot has been missed. The greatest rebounder in the history of the NBA was a man by the name of Wilt Chamberlain. Take a look at this. I got 55 re rebounds against the Boston Celtics uh, in, one, in one particular game. And the thing I remember most about the 55 rebounds is that when the game was over, that I was probably more tired than I've ever been in my entire life. And also, though, I also was probably as happy as ever been because not only it helped us to win a game, but it was against like the best rebounder that I've ever been of, and against the best team that ever played the game of basketball. And I knew that this is what I was supposed to do if I really wanted to dominate uh, the game, was to rebound. And it was something also very gratifying. Right? You, know, you go up there and you kind of grab that ball and you squeeze it and you say, it's mine. Fifty-five rebounds in one game. I'd probably be on the bench after four, but just truly amazing. Now, when it comes to rebounding, the offensive rebound is the most important of them all. The defensive rebound is when the other team shoots, you get the rebound, and you pass the ball back down the courts. The offensive rebound is when you shoot the shot, you miss, but you get the ball back, giving your team another chance to score again. Basketball coaches will tell their players to follow the shot when you shoot. After you shoot, they'll say, crash the boards, follow the shot. Basically, after you shoot the ball, immediately head towards the basket to grab the rebound in case you miss the shot. Can I tell you this morning, when it comes to life, the most important thing is not, well, not how well you can shoot the ball. It's how well you can rebound when you miss the shot. But a lot of people never go for the rebound. They shoot the ball and they miss. And instead of going after the rebound, they head to the sidelines with their heads down thinking of themselves as a failure. Here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, which we read just a moment ago, Paul is writing this letter to a young man named Timothy. Timothy's a young pastor at the time. And he's been pastoring this church of Ephesus for about four years when Paul writes this letter. Paul wrote this letter as a word of encouragement as he is sitting in a dark, damp prison, Roman prison cell. He knew his death is certain, and in fact, shortly after writing this letter to Timothy, Paul is sentenced to death by beheading from the Romans, uh, ending his life. But here in the second chapter, Paul is telling Timothy to not get involved in foolish arguments that only start fights. Have you ever, ever been in a foolish argument and ended up getting into a fight? I think we probably all have. He instructs him to be kind to everyone. He instructs him to be patient with difficult people. If they oppose the truth, don't put them down, don't belittle them, but rather be gentle with them. So he's giving him advice on how to deal with people, primarily difficult people. Paul's reasoning behind this is that perhaps God will change their hearts and they will eventually accept the truth. If Timothy treats people that oppose him harshly, He's only going to push them further away from the truth. And unfortunately, this is what we've seen over the COVID fiasco. 
Many Christians cared more about pushing their opinion than treating people with kindness, respect, and love. And the result has been pushing people even further away from the truth. Paul warns Timothy that type of behavior will cause more harm than good. And verse 26 is the why. Verse 26 is the reason that we are patient with people. It's the reason that we are kind to everyone. It's the reason we gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Verse 26 again. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at will. The word recover is from a Greek word that means come back to a proper state of mind to get self-control to sober up. It's a picture of someone falling down, but rather than staying down by the grace of God, they get back up. It's a picture of someone taking a shot in life and missing their shot, but rather than heading towards the bench, they go in for the rebound. Paul is saying, Timothy, have grace with people. Love people. You don't know where they've been. You don't know what they've gone through. Some people have lost their marriage, and now they're bitter. Some have given into addiction, and they've lost their hope. Some have been without a job or a home, and now they just feel like giving up. Love people, Timothy. Encourage them to get back up when they fall down. Encourage them to crash the boards and follow their shot. Encourage them to go get the rebound. Let me tell you something. Just because you have fallen, just because you have failed, does not mean that God is done with you yet. The fact that you're still breathing is proof that God still has a purpose for you, but you have to go after the ball. You have to go back after the shot that you missed. You have to go after the rebound. For some of you, it feels like when you missed your shot, the ball rolled over the edge of a mountain and down the hill. You feel like there's no hope. If that's true of you, I need you, here's what you need to do. You need to strap up your shoelaces and you need to start down the hill after it. I don't care how far down that mountain that ball has rolled. Don't you dare quit. Don't you dare give up. Recover yourself out of the snare of the devil, Paul says. Go get your rebound. The ball is rolling down the side of the mountain. So basically what that means is your situation looks hopeless. Know this, the ball won't roll downhill forever. Every mountain has a valley. That ball's going to stop rolling eventually, but the valley's where none of us like to be. You get down there in that valley, you pick up the ball, and you start climbing back up that mountain again, and when you get back to the top of that mountain, you take another shot, and you take another shot, and you take another shot until that ball gets in the hoop. Recover yourself out of the snare of the devil. The Bible is full of people that had miserable failures. It's full of examples of people that missed their shot, but instead of giving up, they went after the rebound. Some of them did give up for a while, but they got back up. And when they got back up, God used them to change the world. Moses, look at him. He killed a man. He was insecure. He had a low self-image of himself. Just read through the book of Exodus. Moses missed his shot, but instead of going for the rebound, he first, he runs and he hides in the desert for 40 years. He's out tending the flock one day. He comes to a mountain, Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 2. Here's what it says. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of the bush. Moses stared in amazement, though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called him from the middle of the bush. Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Don't come any closer, the Lord warned. I want you to take off your sandals for you're standing on holy ground. I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. How many times when we've messed up, we cover and we hide. We, we keep away from the house of God. We stay away from the very one we need, and that's God Almighty. 
Then the Lord told him, I've certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm I'm aware of their suffering, so I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, all the ites live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. Basically, God comes to Moses and said, Moses, it's time to pick the ball back up. It's time to get back up and take another shot. I'm not done with you yet. So Moses picks up the ball, and he heads back out to take another shot. And if you continue reading the book of Exodus, you'll see that miracle after miracle followed. Moses failed greatly. But with God, his best days were still in front of him. All he had to do was make the choice to pick up the ball and shoot again. Just like Moses, for some of you, this is your burning bush moment right now. God is speaking to you in this moment, and he's telling you, it's time to get back up. It's time to go after the rebound. Your failure does not define you. Your best days are ahead of you, so get that ball and take another shot. Look at King David. He's another example of a missed shot. Let's, let's take a look, quick look at his failure. Second, we see it in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1. In the spring of the year, David was a great king. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to, to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army, laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Late one afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of bed and he was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So she's married, David. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period, then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. And David's like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? And he sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite, which is her husband. So Joab sent him to David. When Uriah arrived, David asked him how Joab and the army were getting along and how the war was progressing. Then Then he told Uriah, go home and relax tonight. David even sent a gift to Uriah after he left the palace But Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. Verse 10. When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and he asked, What's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? Uriah replied, The ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents. And Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would never do such a thing because my buddies are out there on the battlefield. Well, stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day, and the next, David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. But even then, he couldn't get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again, he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. So this guy, he's a man of integrity. So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. So his plans not work, and he wanted him to go home and sleep with his wife to make it look like that was his baby so he wouldn't get busted. So he writes a letter. He goes, that, that failed. I got to do something else. The letter instructed Joab, station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest, then pull back so he'll be killed. So Joab assigned Uriah to a spot close to the city where he knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting. And when the enemy soldiers came out of the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed along with several other Israelite soldiers. Then Joab sent a battle report to David. He told his messenger, report all the news of the battle to the king. So David had him murdered. Now we're going to jump down to verse 26. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. But when the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace She became one of his wives. She gave birth to a son, but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. This story is probably one of the most famous in all of the Old Testament. 
It's the story of a great failure by a great king. As a matter of fact, if you read scripture, you will see that David, this king, was called a man after God's own heart. And he fails. He misses his shot. David ventures out onto the rooftop one day and he sees off in the distance an attractive woman bathing. Here he makes his mistake. He becomes romantically involved with Bathsheba, the wife of one of his soldiers, which we know that we see off in war fighting this battle, which David should be in. Uriah, this man's not just a soldier in his army. Uriah is one of the mighty men listed in 2 Samuel 23. This was one of David's top men. His wife becomes pregnant by David. If you notice from verse 4, it says Bathsheba had been purifying herself from uncleanliness. This confirms that she was not recently pregnant already. So David gets her pregnant. There's no hiding his sin. It's only a matter of time. Everybody's going to know. So what does he do? To, what, what, is, what does he do when he falls into sin? He tries to cover it up. That's what most of us try to do when we mess up and we slip. We try to cover it up. Sends for her husband Uriah to come back from the battle. Uriah comes back. He will not sleep with his wife. And so now David has a dilemma. Uriah is a man of integrity. So David decides to take it a step further. He sends him out to the battle. And he has him murdered. Bathsheba mourns for her husband, more than likely for seven days. And she slips into the royal palace as one of David's wives. It looks like the perfect crime. Everything looks innocent, but here's the thing. God sees everything. Everything looks like it's happily ever after, and then chapter 12 comes. Several months after the murders, because not only did Uriah die, but several other Israelite soldiers died. David killed several men to help to hide this sin. Several months later, God sends a prophet named Nathan to David. This was the same prophet that told David about the eternal dynasty that God had promised him. But he, this time he comes bearing bad news. Let's pick up the story in chapter 12. So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David the story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich, one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep, great many cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little tiny lamb that he had bought. He raised that little lamb and he grew it up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and he drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like, like his baby daughter. One day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man, but instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and he killed it and prepared it for his guest. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then, David, then Nathan said to David, you are that man. The Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king of Israel. I saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Basically saying, God has given you everything, David. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have, you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and have stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you, you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I'll make, an, I'll make this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Now watch. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you. The Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for this sin. Nevertheless, because you've shown utter contempt for, contempt for the word of God by doing this, your, your child will die. After Nathan returned to his home, the Lord sent a deadly illness to the child of David and Uriah's wife. Nathan, the prophet, read David's mail, and David knew it. The baby ends up dying and David ends up dealing with junk the rest of his life because sometimes that's what sin does. And we come to God and we can be forgiven, but sometimes we still have to wrestle with some aftermath of our bad choices. This failure would be one that would forever change his life. It was a horrible failure. But David got on his face before God and he asked for forgiveness. 
And if you read Psalm chapter 51, you'll see his heart cry for forgiveness. He repented, he confessed, he was forgiven. Now he still suffered the consequence because sin carries consequences, but David repented and he was forgiven. He goes on to grab his rebound and he takes another shot. As a matter of fact, God gives him, gives him another child, 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 24. Then David comforted his wife, wife Bathsheba, and she, he went in to lay with her, and she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. Now this birth is puzzling to a lot of people. This man, Solomon, he would carry on the dynasty of David. God gave Solomon an anointing unlike any other. He was the wisest man that ever lived, wrote much of the book of Proverbs. It was in the line of Solomon that Jesus came. And this is where it can get messy because the argument can be made if it wasn't for murder, adultery, lying, and lust, Jesus would have never been born. And it doesn't make sense. Even the Bible writers had problem with this because if you flip over and read the genealogy account in Jesus, of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, you'll read of Ruth, these women, uh, Rahab, Tumor, Tumar, and Mary, but in many translations, Bathsheba's name is left off of the list. It says, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. So you can make the argument, it's a tough pill to swallow, but God wants to show us an important truth here, and here it is. God, only God has the power to take your greatest failure and turn it into something beautiful. But you have to be willing to go after the ball, and you have to be willing to take another shot. And maybe for you, just like with David, that means repenting of your sin and getting your life right with God. Maybe that's where you need to start. We could go on. There are countless other examples in the Bible of people that failed, but they went for the rebound and they took another shot. Elijah battled depression and he was suicidal. Joseph was abused. Job goes bankrupt. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. The Samaritan woman at the well was divorced many times. Noah was a drunk. Jacob was a cheater. Joah, Jonah ran from God. Peter denied Christ three times, then he gets the rebound, he takes another shot, and he ends up preaching to thousands of people, starting the church. Martha struggled with anxiety. Zacchaeus was a greedy man. Paul, look at Paul, he was a Pharisee who killed Christians before becoming one. He grabs the rebound, he takes another shot, and he ends up starting several churches winning thousands to Christ, and we still read his letters today. These people all had failures, but they recovered themselves out of the snare of the devil. They went for the rebound, and they finished their race strong. And I close with a story. I've told you this story before. But I know many of you sitting in this room have never heard it. And it's one of my favorites and the perfect example of a rebounder. I'm going to go ahead and have Sam come on back up at this time. It's the story of the great Mel Trotter. It's said by the age of 20, this man, Mel Trotter, was a hopeless alcoholic. He was so messed up that he didn't have enough money to keep food on the table for his family. It all went to booze. And at the age of two, his young child died of malnutrition. He was such a wretched man that he didn't even have the money to buy, his, buy the clothes, the burial clothes, to put on the back of his little boy for the funeral service. So the neighbors all gathered together to raise enough money to buy an outfit for this child. But that night of the funeral, after everyone was gone, he snuck back, snuck back in, and he took the clothes off of his little boy and sold them for enough money to buy a cheap drink. He described himself at this moment in his life as being so low that he had to reach up to touch bottom. You, maybe some of you are in there in that spot today. You feel like you've just hit the bottom and you're so low, you've just got to reach up just to touch bottom. He even sold his shoes in the cold of winter to buy himself a drink of alcohol. Well, one night, he's walking along the freezing cold waters of Lake Michigan with the intent of jumping in and killing himself in the cold water. He missed his shot in life. He thought it was over. He was a broken man. 
He was hopeless. He was depressed. But as he's making his way to the place where he planned to take his life, he passed what is known as the Pacific Garden Rescue Mission. And as he heard the music coming from inside, he decides to go inside of this little place. It was a church service. And that night when the invitation was given, Mel Trotter made his way up to the front and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. That was the night he decided to go for the rebound, to get back up and go after the rebound. And from that night on, his life was forever changed and God gave him complete victory and deliverance from alcoholism. And here's the amazing thing about this story. Before his death in 1940, Mel would go on and build more mission centers than any other man that has ever lived. 68 to be exact. You may remember the famous cross that would be displayed on the outside of the building stating, Jesus saves. Mel was an outcast. Mel was a foolish thing in the eyes of the world. People looked at him and said, there, he, there goes that a hopeless alcoholic. But when God looked down on him, God did not see that. God sees a broken man full of hurt and full of pain. God seen a man that he loved dearly. God seen a man that he sent his son to die for. And Mel looked up to heaven one night and said, God, I might not be much, but God, all that I have, I give to you. God, tonight I'm going to pick up the ball and I'm going to take another shot. And God uses this man to change the world. Do you believe that God can use you to change the world? Pastor, if you only knew what I've done, if you only know the thoughts I struggle with, Pastor, if you only knew the real me, you would know that God would never want to use someone like me. I've failed and I've failed greatly. And to you, I say this, man, just read your Bible. God restores those that are unwilling to quit. He restores those that are willing to go after the ball and take another shot. Quit believing you're not good enough. Quit believing you're not qualified. Believe the truth, the truth that says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Maybe you're in here today and you feel like a complete failure. Maybe you're in here today and you feel like you've messed up beyond the point of no return. Listen to me. Here's what's amazing about this whole process. God has already picked up the ball from the shot you missed. He's already picked up the ball from the shot you missed. He has your rebound. But he's not going to shoot the shot for you. You got to go grab the ball. And you got to get back up. You got to do not quit. Take that ball and take another shot for the glory of God. I'm going to have you bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, in this place right now, I just pray, God, for those that are maybe in that spot of desperation. God, I believe that when I sat down to write this, God, I believe that there was somebody, God, that is going to be in here today. At least, I know there's at least one person, God, that you wanted to hear this. And that's why they're here today. They weren't even going to come. But they came in because you love them and you wanted them to hear this message. I don't know who it is. But God, I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would speak. You would encourage those that are at this point in their life where they feel like quitting. And today when they leave this place, they'll say, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to go after the rebound and I'm going to try again for the glory of God. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. And I'm going to have you keep your head bowed.